Uh, this work session of Osseo School is conducted at Rice Hills Elementary School in April Grove. It's so good to be here. Um, today is August 16, 2022. The work session is being audio recorded. The recording will be made available on the official website within 24 hours after the work session has ended. Audio recordings of all work sessions will be made available on the district website within 24 hours after, after the work session has ended. The purpose of school board work sessions is to build trust and teamwork, to exchange information and be applicable, to provide uh, direction in order to facilitate efficient and effective decision making at regular board meetings. The outcome of today's work session, our board members will receive updates and information on the district's three-year operational plan. The board calendar will also be reviewed. To acknowledge attendance this evening, I'll ask the board members and district leaders go around the table starting with their names. Um, that's Brian Bass, Assistant Superintendent of Equity. Let me speak about Brian Bass, Assistant <laughs> Superintendent of Equity and Achievement. Good evening, welcome. Okay, that means Director of Student Services. Thomas Brooks, School Board Director. Robin Gonzalez, Director of Learning and Achievement. <clears throat> John Morstead, Executive Director of Finance and Operations. Tanya Simons, School Board Director. Anthony Paternus, Executive Director of Technology. Laurel Anderson, Executive Director of Human Resources. Kelly Parpart, Assistant Superintendent for All Secondary Schools. Kay Ballella, School Community Relations Director. Amy Tollison, the District Level Principal. Brian Stevenson Hall, Executive Director of Community Engagement. Steve Plisk, Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Schools. Jackie Mosqueda Jones, School Board Director. Corey McIntyre, Superintendent. And Tim Palmatier, General Counsel. I am Kelsey Dawson, Law School Board Director. I'm going to hand over to Superintendent McIntyre. Thank you. And I want to take a moment. Uh, Diane Bagley, our new principal here at Rice Lake, is with us and uh, kind of helping us soak in this new addition here. And um, some of you were able to come out mm -hmm. when we had students. And it's such a different feel when you are out here with students using these spaces. But at least it gives you a feel for how this was designed and maybe a little taste of potential um, future 21st century learning spaces as we you know, eventually hope to get to phase two of our building a better future. So this is just one first step in, in realizing that aspiration we have. So um, if you get a moment at a break or afterwards, just kind of take a look around and, and recognize all the different unique and flexible um, opportunities that exist in this space and thank you. Diane, for being with us. Diane, you're a veteran now. You're, what, six weeks in? <laughs> six weeks in, yeah. lifetime of love. She made us with a maple rope parade. Yes. I did. I made yeah. a yeah. yes. That's right. Well, thank you. And we have, thank you to, it's really nice to have our board members and our cabinet members and leaders here at the table together. It's been a few and far between, even since I've become superintendent. So I'm really excited getting back to that partnership and the collaboration amongst our leadership team and our and our school board members. So as a, I'll set up the, the agenda with some comments to start before we jump into the content. And there's a lot of material here and I'll kind of help you sort out what to stay focused on. But um, kind of from a high level, it's good for all of us to keep our minds on the fact that as a district, we're working towards our vision and being proactive and we're working you know, really towards our first year of implementing the new strategic plan, our first real opportunity to, to launch this. And the board and our team have worked hard to reimagine what our schools could look like and what we want our um, scholars, our families, and our staff for their daily lived experience to be. So for the next three years, our vision is to unleash and enhance the brilliance of our scholars to thrive and change the world. And it's gonna take all of us, it's gonna take our community is going to take our families, our scholars, and all of us as employees and our board to bring that vision to life. And um, we are really trying hard to break down, continually break down any silos that exist. And when we hit at our administrative kickoff, our theme is one. So one district for every one and everyone. And that was our, that's our theme to kick off the year. I know many of you were able to join us uh, for Dr. Stephen Peters to really help us drive that theme home. And he's also going to be uh, sharing that same message with all of our employees on uh, August 30th through our live stream event. So we're excited about that coming. Um, I think we all realize there's a lot at hand, there's a lot at stake if our vision isn't achieved. And our scholars, family, staff, and community have identified what they are expecting of us. So um, we, in front of us, there's ways we need to do better in specific ways. So uh, some, some areas uh, kind of globally 
our scholar achievement and how they're achieving academically, the support and connections for our scholars and what we need to do to support their everyday needs, how we continue to give our scholars what they need when they need it. Um, and even as we move into the fall, you know, our, um, our needs financially through funding and um, meeting the demands of our current status with our current referendum that we'll talk more about as we get into our agenda. So I think it's one of those things where we have a lot of challenges. But this, the, the strategic plan and now our operationalized efforts um, that are the new implementation and learning work initiatives in addition to the standard work already in place that we kind of put through the tr strategic um, continuous improvement process is going to get us there. But it's really this team tonight, right? So the people in front of you board members that, that you know well, but it comes down to tonight's about what are we going to do to be implementing um, to, to realize what you've given us from a governance level on the strategic plan. So um, as you look at your packet, there's a number of things that we included that won't be covered tonight, but gives you context. So the department plans from pretty much every department, and then there's three under the Division of Leadership and Teaching and Learning for our student services, um, learning and achievement in our equity departments. So you have a lot of content there. Those are That's meant as background uh, additional information where it um, lays out deeper level work that complements the high priority items that you'll see on the district-wide initiatives. So you also in your packet have a copy of the classroom to boardroom strategic portfolio definitions document and then also a um, visual document of the my own organization going here. I'll just flash a couple things. I want to spend just a minute on this one. It's a visual of kind of our, it's a visual of representing our work together. So on this elements of classroom to boardroom strategic planning process, if you look at that, at the center are our scholars, our staff, our families, and that is our daily experience. Board members, as a governance, uh, you led the way in the strategic roadmap and strategic plan and continuing to work on the district long range planning our, your board structure and workflow, and then that as we aspire to our three-year plan. That came after we consulted with our community, our, our families, our scholars, our staff. We did the story wall. We did the environmental scan. We got input and feedback on those desired daily experiences. Some of that happened pre-pandemic, and then we went back and did it again because our, our, re, our reality changed. Um, and then they, we finally got some feedback on that strategic roadmap before you approved it. Well, after those two things, now it's our, in the administration's hands, the management team, as we develop the three-year operational plan, develop our vision cards, our department improvement plans, and our school improvement plans, and getting those all in alignment. And it's taken us moving into year four of my time here just to get to this point. Um, so we're excited about that and really being able to have a big impact on our district. So that that's just a kind of a refresher. Uh, I did include that definitions document because there's we're, terminology we're still kind of getting comfortable with. Um, I also just want to thank our leadership team, our cabinet members, and our other directors and, and leaders that are here because um, change is hard, and we've had to push through kind of what um, out of our comfort zone as we began to build out these district initiatives, our, de and our department and school level plans. So, uh, but we also realized to make successful shifts, we're going to have to do what works and let go of what doesn't and then uh, begin to continue to reinforce the accountability uh, practices to ensure good things are happening and, and results are happening. And um, really reimagine the things that may be no longer serving our, our scholars. So trying to leverage that creative spirit, innovation, and embracing new mindsets is kind of what's in front of us. Um, tonight's an informational item. Uh, the board doesn't act on this. This is really our work internally that we're sharing with you in, in the spirit of consultation and getting feedback as we continue to refine. So as we move through the course of the year, uh, you'll see later tonight we've mapped out built-in checkpoints and monitoring reports so that you can give us feedback. And, you know, we don't know always what's coming in front of us. Uh, we've experienced that over the last few years. So there will be revisions. There will be improvements. There will be changes and adaptations to what we have in front of you tonight. It's a, it's a fluid um, model that will allow us to make adjustments throughout. And, and I will cover later how we are making changes to how our leadership is 
strategically monitoring our own progress internally ahead of when we report to the board. Uh, we've been in kind of a reactive mode for pretty much three years. And so this is the first time I feel like we've been really able to begin to map out proactively with intention uh, a stronger um, continuous improvement cycle. Um, also in your materials is a copy of the strategic growth and change visual, which is really the backbone of, of this uh, work initiative document. So uh, I gotta find my own copy here. That one, um, who's got it in front of them? Here's the big, this one, thank you. So this is a visual of what we're gonna talk through tonight. And this is our continuous improvement model. We talk about um, what are our learning items, what are our implementation items this year, which we'll start with. And then over the course of the year, we're going to continue to inventory what is our standard work, some practices that are solidly in place. And some of those might need to come back for a continuous review uh, if they need uh, strengthening. So the, and the bulk of our work is in standard work. So the time we're spending on the new initiatives is, is a smaller portion of what's in front of us for the year. But this is a good visual way of representing uh, how we do that, and then also what are the emerging influences if you look at the top, and then what needs to lead the system as we go to the right on the bottom uh, in the types of work. And we're all getting comfortable with kind of a new way of describing how we, the vocabulary, the language used to talk about our continuous improvement strategies. So we're going to walk through for about the first hour, and I think there's 30 items. So we're going to try to be really concise, high level, brief summary. Um, to give you a little bit of context of what each implementation initiative is about. And then we'll move into learning work initiatives. So those are the things that we're researching, we're testing, we're studying, trying to decide whether they move to an implementation item. And uh, as you look at this document, the one that we'll spend the most time on, um, I'll point out right away in our standard work practices, during COVID, we were not able, as most districts, we were not able to really move a whole lot to standard practice because we were really living in operational challenges. And I'll just highlight this corner box down here with COVID. And that really sums up most of the last three years, uh, the preparedness and responses that we had to do around all those areas. You know, those are really our key indicators that we were reporting to you on frequently. We were able to move some things forward with DL4A and our pre-K technology. And another example is our triad committee or curriculum instruction and assessment committee. That is, we were able to move that into standard practice as well, thanks to Robin and her team. And I know Jackie and Heather have served as board members on that. So there are some examples of standard work, but uh, we've been kind of mired in a lot of new learning and um, getting to a point of some new implementation. So, this is about as much as you hear me talking tonight. I'm going to begin to, you know, I'm excited to, to have our cabinet team and leadership team get their voice in the space with you uh, and the board and really showcase and identify and highlight some of the key elements of the implementation work and learning work. Um, if there's follow-up specific things you might want after tonight, we're more than happy to dig deeper. And you'll see some of those things articulated in the department plans. So their department plans take some of these items and drive it down even deeper and include additional work that is happening in each department that's not necessarily a high priority item. I think the cabinet would, um, we've talked a lot about my, my fear of there's a lot here. So when you think about a lot of organizations and you've worked with organizations, say so what's your three to five top priorities? Well, we have 30 here, so that's ambitious. Um, but as we worked through this list, we really felt like, well, we can't take that off. That's a big deal. And we can't take that off. That's a big deal. We did really try to boil this down to the, the key items that we think need to impact the system now. And then what are some other items that are learning? And then there's another set of items that are kind of even further out, like we're wondering about, you know, that might come down the pike later that we're not quite ready to study yet, but we're wondering about. And so those things will, this will continue to materialize and um, I think you'll hear our team talk about, we might realize some of these during the year. Other items might be on your multiple years. So some of these initiatives might be year one, year two, or phase one or phase two. Um, or we might need multiple years for learning work too, depending on the pace and learning that we have. We will make decisions on whether things move from learning to full implementation. So we'll talk through that a little bit as well. Um, let me just make sure I haven't missed anything here as far as your packet goes. We'll get to the one-year board calendar at the end, and then I've developed a superintendent annual calendar to tie all these elements together. 
Um, that'll give you a visual representation of how we're trying to align our administrative work with the board direction moving forward. So this is an at-a-glance version. It's a one-pager. And our next step is to develop a three-year uh, plan. So what you might see in next year's is some of the learning work moving to implementation. Maybe some of the impl implementation items moving to standard work if we've arrived there at that point. And that's something we're continuing to, to build out with our, with our leaders. But this is really now the day-to-day -day way of uh, putting in place the strategic plan that, that the board has set for us. So I'm going to just uh, start us off, uh, and we've we got cabinet members and team members identified to give the brief updates, and we're, we were kind of thinking about two minutes or less in each one. That gets us to about an hour. So if you're willing to tolerate us presenting this and giving you the full picture, then we can come back to questions that you have on any, any particular items so you get the <coughs> context. And the, the first one um, you've heard a lot about, uh, I'll start in the middle column on implementation because I think our focus tonight is on the implementation items that we are moving, in, moving on this year. And then we'll go next to the learning work after that. And the first one at the top, let's kind of work our way down. Um, this is around strategic direction A, creating safe, welcoming, inclusive learning environments that foster global curiosity, belonging, innovation, and engagement. And the first one is our building a better future phase one. Um, our operational and technology referendum, and you've had a lot of information um, about this uh, over the last few months, and you know we're ramping up to November. Actually, early voting starts next month, so we're already on the doorstep of that. Um, I, it's odd, though, as much as we've been pushing and, and communicating, I just met someone the other day that really hadn't heard it at all. It was like their first time. So. Uh, never assume everyone's been hearing about our, about the information uh, campaign, and or if it feels like we're being a bit too repetitive, there's still people we're not uh, always connecting with. Um, so uh, if you have that experience, just continue to steer them towards the resources. Um, our, we're asking our community to reinvest in our district to maintain and address those growing needs that we have. Um, I'll have an enrollment update for the board by the end of the week, but I was stuck with our team and Jim Greeley again today. We are, we are, we're up about 400 students uh, um, in our enrollment. Uh, when you look at new enrollments versus withdrawals, we're, we're netting plus 400 or more. Now, it's, Jim will say it's day-to-day, -day and it's volatile. It changes a lot, and there's a lot of variables at play there. As we move into the November election, that first question is, again, on our day-to-day -day learning operations in um, enhancing that individualized learning, academic intervention, mental health, and other classroom supports. But the core of this is it's our people. 85% of our budget is our staff. So those dollars are really paying for the people to implement the programs and deliver on all those uh, things that it includes. Even in the technology arena, that also pays for some of our staff to support our technology needs. Uh, so just purely from an informational perspective, that's something at the core of it. If it fails, I always like to cover this too, um, we'll start with a $5 million cut, and if we can't renew it next year, now we're talking more like a $50 million cut, and that's as high as 450 jobs that we won't be able to maintain. So after phase one, phase two is facility needs, and we're, you're going to see in the calendar our pre-planning for bringing phase two uh, recommendations through the oversight task force to the board for facility recommendations as we get deeper into the school year. I don't think I'll spend much more time on, on that because you're well, well tuned in. I'll just mention we have three more community sessions in September as we're getting closer to the election data to make sure we have factual information being provided. Um, and then, if uh, again, if you're hearing or need any additional support, we have lots of materials. Okay, we have lots of materials, but I think we had to reprint our half sheets because we ran out. So we're, we're really trying to get. Okay, says so that's a good thing. So. Um, <laughs> um, I think that's probably the, the big thing I wanted to cover with Building a Better Future Phase 1. So that's a massive uh, initiative for us and a very time-consuming one for all of us. And I want to thank Kay and John and the rest of our team. Um, I, we're doing a training for all of our building teams tomorrow. I don't know how many people you're expecting there, Kay. I've got about 100. Yeah, so just informational training. So we're really making sure we're not only following the rules, but um, using our, our schools to make sure they're communicating in an effective way. With that, I'm going to move on to the next item, 279 online, and I've asked Anthony to, to speak briefly to this one. 279 online, we're moving into phase three of implementation, and um, over the years, you guys have all heard different pieces of information as we've gone through the development of this. Last year, we excitedly launched the first year of our official comprehensive 
program K through 12 uh, with approximately a thousand students enrolled for that first inaugural year and a beautiful graduation at the end of the year at, at the U of M which was which was wonderful to see um, as we move into this year there's kind of two parts to what we're doing with 279 online. One is to strengthen and build upon the comprehensive program to keep the momentum going with that. And the second component is to start building the systems and structures for supplemental um, online learning. So our, our students in our comprehensive high schools could take a course or two courses in an online format should they choose to build that within their schedule. For uh, phase three, we are targeting specifically grades nine through 12 with the program kind of initially building around students that we know are taking uh, supplemental online courses in Northern Star Online or other supplemental online providers. So trying to find out what courses they're taking, why they're taking them, and how we can have them come back into Aussie area schools and take that within our online programming. So that's our work within 279 Online for this coming school year. Okay, and our next and last item with Strategic Direction A is our multi-tier system of support around behavior, so that's Amy and Kate to update us. And it's actually going to be Amy and Robin. <laughs> 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 our MTSS <laughs> work. <laughs> right. So, um, and we're speaking to it because it, it scans or it spans both Strategic Direction A and B, so we'll be speaking to both parts in kind of this update. So we this year we're going to be implementing our social-emotional learning curriculum. We're really excited about that. For the last two years, it's been in learning work, and so it moves to implementing this um, this year. It, we are implementing K through 12th grade, and so we've begun training teachers on the new curricular materials. They're going to have training again in October and again in November with the expected implementation and the second try starting in December. Very excited about that. So teachers are being able this August to kind of dig into the materials, try things as they want to, and then we will be implementing in December. Also in Tier 1, which is that piece that everyone gets, um, we're continuing to focus on those high-impact instructional strategies and really supporting teachers so that their core instruction is really strong, so fewer students will need those other tiers, the Tier 2 and Tier 3 support. So that continues and has been an implementation the last few years, but we know that as we come back from coming through many models of instruction, we need to reinforce that again, what it looks like in person and then also online. And for then for those students that need additional support are the two tier two and tier three supports. And we are in our second year of implementing ADCESS, which are interventionists that we provide for all um, all sites across the system, including 279 online. And the interventionists provide support for students in both reading and math. And also in our second year is our fast bridge assessments, which gives screening and progress monitoring assessments that we give um, so that teachers know better how to focus their instruction and make sure they're meeting the individual needs of the students. Um, and then our last piece on this is really providing that accelerated learning piece and the supports that students need so that they can access the grade level curriculum. And we know that as we came back from COVID, that was something we really focused on, making sure that our instruction doesn't go back and we don't remediate, but we move forward and continue to support those students. And then Amy's going to speak to you on some more tier two and three supports. So before you do that, board members, um, many of those items have come through our kayak committee, and those briefing memos are in your shared drive, right? Um, mm -hmm. So in case you want a little more details as that process, program improvement process has come full circle. Absolutely. So thanks, Robin. In addition to um, the supports that we are receiving through our social emotional learning at Tier 1, um, also with our PBAS work that we have in place um, around Tier 1, we're thinking about what are the additional needs of our scholars um, around Tiers 2 and Tier 3. And so some examples of those that are in our system that we continue to provide support for are um, things such as restorative circles that we offer to build communities, um, thinking about what are the proactive pieces where we really want to be spending majority of our time building communities in our classroom, and when situations arise, um, then we respond to those. Some additional um, of the supports that I am referencing, also we have something called SABERS, which is a social-emotional screening tool, so we can identify um, students that might be in need of additional support. 
We have something called I Am Four, which is also a way to work individually trying to really identify the root cause of needs for our students and then develop a plan for a specific individual student. Um, and then we also, as you know, added in additional um, FTE through counselors and psychologists outside, for example, psychologists outside of just special education with the goal that they are providing additional supports. Um, and that could be things like small groups, um, more check-ins for students, um, so providing some of those more personalized supports that can really help um, some of our students and the needs that they have. And um, in addition to the supports we're providing for our students, we still continue to provide professional development for our staff to build their capacity around understanding restorative practices um, and trauma-informed practices as well. I would add to it, Kate, uh, thanks for your work on this. Um, we continue to build, and it's been a challenge because it's high demand, but our therapeutic uh, mental health partners, mm -hmm. so that's clinical therapy mental health partners that um, We've, we've had it's been a bit of a challenge and then this year we'll be diving deeper into where it says supporting scholars in crisis we're really unpacking the different kinds of crisis whether it's actually, uh, scholars in crisis due to a divorce whether it's a basic needs shelter food uh, crisis whether it's um, a mental health emotional or social uh, crisis or um, even maybe a, a physical pr health crisis. So we're really trying to dive into that because our social work, all of our support staff, if we can learn how, how that's occurring in our system, we can target the services even more specifically. So that's a, an added, we're even considering how we can provide you with a, and all of us with a scorecard around how we're uh, measuring and targeting those supports in those areas. So that's work that's coming up in implementation. Um, Kate, I don't know if you want to add anything here. Um, along with those supports, yeah. we have a homeless liaison who works with the more than 500 students generally by the end of the year that are identified as homeless. And we added another social worker to with another grant with Homework Begins at Home to bridge homework and school. So she works closely with families to keep them. Um, the goal is it's a county grant to keep people in their homes uh, and um, successful in school. So we're the successful at school component of it, but we partner with the county for the other part. Okay, so I'm going to move hey, on. Oh, yeah. um, Robin, so, you know, I think this board has been really supportive of the social emotional learning. Um, so I think it's so, great. What um, kind of communication, will there be communication to families so to really reinforce your support or even have their own tools to? Yes, absolutely. Once we um, do the professional development in November, we'll be um, having the pilot teachers can create a communication piece to share with the whole system about what the content is of the social emotional learning pieces so that um, parents will understand like what's coming up, what they can expect their students to be talking about. Great, thank you. All right, uh, strategic direction letter B, build and nurture a culture of achievement by providing content-rich, rigorous, equitable, and individualized pathways. So to start in the middle, we have a lot of program improvement work coming, a lot of new curriculum uh, changes to curriculum, and any one of these on any given year is a lot of work, and we have multiple coming this year and next year. And so Robin and her team have a lot of interesting work coming their way, and I'll turn it over to Robin to sure. talk about the different things that are implementation this year. Yeah really excited about our science implementation that we'll be doing. So we'll be implementing new science curriculum materials in elementary, eighth grade, physics, and chemistry. So this has been an ongoing process as it's been in learning work for quite a few years, just really learning about the new science standards and then with um, the interruption kind of in with MDE's work and our work connected is kind of postponed until now, but we're very excited about that. Um, what we'll see and what students will see are different practices of really being deeply engaged in the science instruction instead of having a teacher tell them about science, they'll be discovering it themselves with hands-on activities. Um, both the middle school and high school will be in the second year of math implementation, which also is a very hands-on process, a very student-centered um, conversation, um, cooperative process. So last year they began, um, and this year we're going to continue. And we're going to be closely monitoring the 
implementations of the new resources with conversations with teachers, classroom visits, um, student surveys, just to make sure that students and teachers have the support they need to engage in the mm -hmm. learning that's taking place in their classroom and the materials, the new materials that you we're using. We'll also continue to provide professional development throughout the year and really um, at the end of the year really dig deep into some surveys from teachers to make sure that they have the training they need and the materials they need and they're meeting the students needs. I think board members as we get deeper into this with our um, and the learning work you'll see later this will really have the potential to make a dramatic impact on our results. So it's not only materials but it's instructional um, practice mm -hmm. strategies methodology right that we think uh, with those <clears throat> new tools and with a strong professional development approach that will have a significant impact academically on our, our results. Um, we'll hear a little bit more about the things that are in study this year. Another long list um, coming up. Alright, our system-wide equity tools and training 1.0. Uh, I know Dwayne was going to, he wasn't able to be here with us due to a family uh, situation, so thank you Brian for helping us. Sure, I just would uh, preface um, context that we we have a new director of, of educational equity in the last year we have a new assistant superintendent for equity achievement in the last uh, seven and a half months so when we think about the work of operationalizing equity in our system there there has been a history <coughs> over 20 years of the district's work leading um, for equity and students at the center and so um, Prior to COVID, we were we were making significant progress in a number of system tools that were sur uh, supporting leaders across the system and educators across the system, and helping them respond to uh, some of the disparities that we have in our system. So, as we have engaged in developing a three-year operational plan within the, the Department of Educational Equity, there was a, a study of the last 20, 20 years to really understand the tools uh, that have been key in helping us as a system advance. So in that review came sort of reclaiming what our focus is for equity um, in the system. I just I want to read that and then I'll, I'll speak very briefly to the two implementation, uh, to the implementation work uh, within systems, system equity tools and training. So the Department of, Edu of Educational Equity maintains a collaborative commitment to racial equity and educational excellence for each and every scholar in Osceola area schools. We work to remove systemic barriers and create equitable, effective, and innovative learning environments where the race, ethnicity, culture, religion, language, ability, sexual orientation, and gender identity of each scholar is valued and that it contributes to successful educational outcomes. So just wanted to provide that background and context to the items here. So <clears throat> one of the foundational trainings for all new employees that come into our system that we had paused during COVID because it is it is absolutely an in-person experience. It doesn't translate well to, to virtual or uh, online is our EFT, Equity Foundations Training 1.0. And so that will be kicking off next week with new, new staff coming uh, in next week for that kickoff training. The outcomes of this particular training include utilizing our systems tools to establish a common language throughout our system to increase, uh, to increase staff consciousness around the influence of race and culture on learning and to evaluate their beliefs and convictions about race and culture. And the last one is to be prepared to implement personal commitments that align with the district's mission. So that's one layer of the, the system equity tools and training. The other is the uh, continued implementation of our equity teams and our equity team seminars. And our equity team seminars serve to support site leaders in helping them have a leadership team at the site level that advances this work in helping their entire building identify and respond to the influence of race and culture on learning. So there'll be four equity team seminars planned for this year. And so that um, will be happening this year. So I'll, I'll pause there. I can keep going. There's a lot of exciting work happening. But in the implementation, those are the two pieces that, that the department will be focusing on in the implementation lane. Yeah, and our goal tonight was kind of high-level yeah. um, uh, summary overview information, but I will, you reminded me that um, later in the evening you'll see how we've mapped out when you get monitoring reports and updates on each of the five strategic directions, we've mapped them out for the year. So we haven't had that since I've been here. We've, you'll be able to anticipate when you'll get updates as we um, bring, you know, how the, how the progress is happening uh, throughout the year. 
So I'll move on to, I think, Kate, you're going to talk a little bit about, and I can help out too if you need it, uh, uh, the Special Opportunity Review Action Plan Year 1, and it's probably a multi-year um, initiative, implementation initiative. So the Special Education Opportunity Review was presented to you, the findings were presented to you at the end of the last school year. This year in the Student Services Department Plan, you're, you will notice that it, um, we are called to create a plan to address concerns identified in the Special Education Opportunity Review and the DMG audit, as you're familiar with. So a stakeholder team will be convened uh, with stakeholders from every site. And this team will address, and it's in conjunction with EMO, so as I know Kelly's sitting behind me, mm -hmm. uh, it is in with conjunction with EMO, uh, will address the identified concerns. And those are teachers do not feel they have open lines of communication between themselves and the district. Teachers desire additional professional development opportunities for special education. Teachers and students would benefit from a more cohesive, strategic approach to intervention practices and scheduling, clarify and modify roles and responsibilities for special education teachers, um, and DMG, just to clarify what you heard last year, they identified resources, resource teachers for the purposes of the study, what you heard last year, which, and then again, further work would be then for our self-contained teachers. So as you can see, this will be a multi-year and one of, the, one of the things we're exploring is um, potentially working with the University of Minnesota and the Center for Applied um, Carry, yep. Carry, Center but for Applied Applied Innovation and Educational Improvement. If I can get that right. Um, they really um, they have a little more depth and expertise in the special arena than what we got from DMG. So now that we've identified the key areas, we're exploring the partnering with them to maybe do a second shorter phase of additional analysis before we launch the, uh, the work of our action planning team. We're meeting on this tomorrow. So we have some, we want to strengthen what we learned and then really with the uh, partnership with EMO, um, have a strong uh, <coughs> first year action plan that will involve our teachers in, in a big part of that work. So I'll have more updates for you as we get closer. I think within the next month we'll, we'll potentially um, finalize the the partnership with the U of M. Um, the Curie Department's really bolstered their work and have done a lot of um, additional deep dive special ed analysis. So I know uh, Kate and her team are, are ready to, to go that direction. Okay, um, so I think we covered MTSS. Yes? Yep. So now I'm down to uh, strategic direction C, promote inclusive participation of our communities and provide timely, relevant, and easily accessible communication. So to start, um, Kay is going to talk about year one of our district commu district-wide communication plan. Thank you, Corey. So our district-wide communication plan, every communication plan has four parts to it as research, planning, implementation, and evaluation. So last school year, we focused on the research phase of things a bit. So we did a lot of quantitative and qualitative research, that including looking at a lot of surveys, kind of what we were already doing um, communications-wise. We also did an audit. So really... Um, just finding out how we could communications wise around our district communications. So from there we developed goals, objectives, and strategies. Um, and then we have a list of tactics, kind of like the house or e-newsletters, et cetera, on how we get information out. So we're going to be starting those tactics and tools this coming school year. Some of them are going to be familiar and some of them are going to look a little bit new or have a little bit of different spin to them. So um, that is just coming up and that's in now, so moving from the first research phase to now implementation for the district-wide communication plan. And we'll be talking a little bit more about school kind of pieces of that here coming up. Likely a multi-year plan as well, um, the way that we anticipate that to go. Thank you, Kay. Uh, next is our family and community engagement plan, and we're in year two, so another multi-year initiative. So this one is uh, a bit briefer. Uh, the, the visions for our family and community engagement uh, program is that we want to ensure that every scholar and family in our community feels seen, heard, and welcomed, that we deepen those connections and strengthen our partnerships with the greater Osseo Area Schools community, and that we empower parents as advocates for their scholars. So this year's implementation work will be to identify strategic community partnerships in the Brooklyn's, Maple Grove, and Osseo, to introduce and apply the family engagement rubric, um, which you may have, you may recall seeing at one of our other uh, board meetings. 
in the uh, board of uh, updates, and then uh, to support the RISE committee and its work. So those are the implementation work initiatives for in the community engagement for this year. We got three in a row from you, Brian. So let's All right. How many mm -hmm. people are on that team? Four, and one role is vacant, um, and we're we're interviewing to hire for the last role. Yeah. So it's a four-person team. It's it's. Well, we aspire to more, right? Right. We, we do. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a resource uh, issue. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you kind of lead led us to the next one, Brian, the Rice Committee, if you want to kill it. It says phase two, I think year two. Right. Um, same thing? Yep, yep, sure. So uh, last year's work was to establish the committee um, and to establish ambassadors for uh, throughout our community. And uh, they also partnered with several, the committee also partnered with several departments, um, including uh, communications um, and also risk management around harm protocol. And, uh, and that feedback has, has been very valuable. Uh, this upcoming year, we're looking to grow the participation and the representation on the RISE Committee, as well as uh, partner to ensure strong representation across other district-level committees. And so, uh, so that's the work for this year. So I should, that was really brief, but let me say it one more time. So <laughs> one, to increase uh, representation and participation from all stakeholders across the community, continue strengthening that, and then two, to partner um, in increasing representation from diverse members of our community on other district level committees where we have voices that are missing. So, and then next is our American Indian Improvement, uh, American Indian Program Improvement Plan. And I, I do think of this one as year one. Sure. We didn't put year one here, but it, it, it's possible this turns into a multi year effort as well. Um, well. We'll know more about the end of the year. So, Brian, if you want to highlight some of the work there, board members are pretty familiar with the. Um, Eight areas were identified through our concurrence mm -hmm. work, and that's kind of driving this improvement program. Right. And our, our American Indian Education Program, just as a reminder, is is designed to uh, affirm the indigenous cultural identities of our scholars um, who identify, who have identity, indigenous identity. And so we had eight recommendations that came to us at the concurrence vote that was presented by uh, the co-chairs at that time, Marlene and Jessica. And we, we've, we've been working hard um, across departments to ensure that we're prioritizing those items. And so what we'll see this year in implementation work uh, starting this Thursday, uh, we'll be introducing sovereignty lessons, um, which position the tribal nation flags and lessons as sovereignty lessons. Um, and so that will, those will be introduced to the principals uh, this Thursday and then uh, they'll be communicating with their staff and having through October 31st, Robin, mm -hmm. um, to teach those lessons. And so be, those, those lessons and materials have already been developed and been shared with our APAC chairs. So uh, thank you to, to the interdepartmental collaboration on that. The, the second area for implementation work around program improvement is to, is to recognize indigenous people's days um, in months, so that's the Indigenous Peoples Day, it's National Native American Heritage Month, and in Minnesota, uh, there is a specific um, cultural celebration for the month of May, American Indian uh, Heritage Month, that's specific to Minnesota um, expression. So that is the second area. Um, there are some additional pieces that I think just clarify agreements that we already have in our system around designated spaces, that um, American Indian Education staff come into buildings to deliver lessons and programming, that we're, we're clear that, that those are there um, and that that partnership is there with each of our sites. And then for making sure that the curriculum uh, throughout students' experiences, not just during Indigenous Peoples Day or those, those months of recognition, but that there is visibility for our scholars to see themselves in the curriculum throughout. We are, uh, returning with, we're returning to the Bedote professional learning experience for all of our sixth grade social studies teachers. That will be implemented in the spring this year. All of our, our sixth grade teachers will be uh, participating in a uh, professional learning experience. And, and then they will be facilitating those same tours starting in 23-24 
with all sixth grade students in the system. So that that is work happening there. And then um, the other the other advancement that we've made is around. Uh, there were some concerns about the invisibility of the uh, indigenous student data um, in our reporting, and so we have worked hard to address the sample size to to be um, more inclusive of our our indigenous perspectives and voices. So those are the, the pieces that we we're working we're working hard on. And there's, there's a couple more, and we'll provide that update later. So and we will continue with our required consultation with the MDE's Tribal uh, Nations Education Committee. I think Thomas and Tanya have both been a part of that over the last few years. Tina, yep. So that will continue as well. Or moving on to strategic direction, letter D, create a system of operational innovation, excellence, accountability, and sustainability. And we'll start with John, kind of giving us a brief update with our emergency preparedness and response. Thank you. So just as a quick reminder, the, the, the staff that normally are doing our emergency preparedness and response over the last two and a half years essentially became the COVID response team. So they, um, at our direction, switched gears and focused all their attention on COVID and less on emergency preparedness and response. So we're moving back to where we would like to be. That's where our initiative for this year is. So the goal is continuing to implement, train, and retrain ways to ensure the safety, well-being of all scholars, staff, and visitors with the goal of ensuring a safe and welcoming school environment and climate. So we had a, a strategic in, um, investment where we added an additional staff member to that group. So we're um, focusing our attention really on the training and retraining to make sure everyone knows all the tools that are there available to them and how to use them properly so we can react um, should a situation arise. And we you know, had the recent presentation uh, board meeting and then we have our community uh, meeting next Tuesday night as well. So you know, school safety continues to be something we're hyper focused on, uh, not just our district, all districts, but uh, we're trying to share with our community what our foundational um, structures are in that you know, we'll address some concerns there. The next item is, I'll just take this one, it's in your packet, so I won't spend a lot of time in it. The department plans, Kate alluded to them, Brian, that's the, the deeper dive into the work that you're hearing behind some of these initiatives and other work mm -hmm. that's in each department, 3 and three DLTL, but that includes HR, goes across the board here, so technology, HR, uh, community education, Brian's area, and community relations as well. And then um, I'll just mention now while it's on my mind, you'll have the template examples for our site plans that will now align to the department plan. So you'll hear a bit more about them in a minute. Kelly and Steve will, will touch on that. But those, those templates are in there so you can see the connections in alignment there. So um, you'll hear more about those departmental plans as we move through, but you have as background information now how we're starting the year with those those plans. So I know it's a lot of information, um, but I think you need it all to have the full context. Cybersecurity plan, phase two, Anthony. Yes, just like we talk a lot about the physical security and emergency response within our organization as we continue to move our organization operationally and instructionally into the 21st century, we're deeply digitally connected. Um, and as we've seen coming out of the pandemic, schools have become a hot spot for cyber cyber attacks and cyber criminals so um, this is this is not the the second year of moving into cybersecurity we've been doing this for years but a larger concerted effort around a comprehensive plan around cybersecurity response and planning which started with the planning phase and initial training of, of employees last year um, and this year we're going to continue to expand what that training looks like as well as continuing to review and build out our cybersecurity response plan. So should we have a ransomware attack or a data breach or uh, a phishing, uh, a, a large scale phishing scam, how do we respond to that and make sure that we're protecting all of our student, staff, um, and families information um, and systems to make sure that we can continue to operate and function uh, as an organization. In the department plan, you'll see kind of the deeper technical aspects that we're doing within cybersecurity response within uh, year two as well. And I think I have the next two, so I, I might just Yeah, the only comment I might have before you move forward is <laughs> That's right. our referendum really does, can, don't forget that it's about our physical safety. There's items in there around physical safety and cyber 
security from that technology capital projects levy. And then also on the psychological safety side that you've seen the reports from us, um, that's a key element of our referendum and in investing in those staff that provide those services. So I want to tie that all together. So thank you for moving on to the print study action plan. Um, so print study, uh, we were in a learning phase last year trying to understand our, our printing environment and the strategy that we have around printing as an organization. Um, and we have known and we're kind of confirmed with our print study audit that um, we have a really disjointed print environment with multiple print solutions providing services to print within our organization and multiple solution providers servicing and supporting our, our print equipment. Um, so out of that study in the learning phase last year, we identified a comprehensive uh, printing strategy for our organization to manage and um, support all of the print equipment and the printing needs that our organization does. And so we will be moving into implementing that plan. We're currently in the process of evaluating and looking at all of the print equipment that we have right now to get um, kind of refreshed and replaced. We have some very old multifunctional machines going on 10, 12 years old that are having to call the service provider on a weekly basis that we need to get upgraded and, and into place. Um, we're also going to be looking at um, how do we create security and efficiencies within that print environment? So when we think about the cybersecurity lens as well within our print environment, every time we send data to a print job, that data gets captured. Um, so, And we also have print jobs that could release with confidential data on there. So how do we secure when that printing occurs? So we're going to be implementing an environment where um, employee ID badges actually releases that print job when you walk up to the print station and moving towards a... Uh, 10 to 1 ratio. So what that means is one printing station for every 10 employees. Currently we're at about a 3 to 4 uh, employees for every printing station as an organization. So looking at um, cost efficiencies and operational efficiencies as well as the, the security and the technical environment for efficiencies for all of our employees within that print space. Quick question. Will that include the Follow the printer option? Yes, okay. it will. <laughs> and the last one has been on the board's mind for many years before I even came here with online enrollment. So we are moving into year two of our online enrollment. Yes. Model. So I actually, first thing when I came on, heard about this exploration around online enrollment, and we're looking at a uh, an online tool with the former organization ties that didn't really come to fruition. Um, so I know in partnership with, with Brian and, and really the Enrollment Center, this has been a, a great project coming into fruition. Um, we, we started exploration around the online enrollment tool that, that we have in place now uh, approximately two years ago. Uh, last year was the year one implementation where we rolled it out for new kindergarten enrollment. So families, instead of having to show up to the enrollment center and bring all the paper application stuff, now have an online process to be able to enroll into our system. Uh, moving into year two this year, we're going to be working on any new enrollments coming into the, the Osseo uh, area schools K through 12. Um, so that's where we'll be focused on with our online enrollment tool, which will ultimately move into kind of the large scale in district transfer. All those enrollment pieces will be able to, to operate in that online space um, without the need of physically showing up at the enrollment center. The space will still be there at the enrollment center for all the resources and supports that we do provide in that space. Um, which there, there are a, a good variety of things there to support families in our enrollment process. But this will be another option to help with um, families engaging with Osseo Area Schools. And uh, I want to underscore um, what we have at our enrollment center with multiple services in one location is desirable around the state. We continually have districts coming in to see how we pull that off because we have kind of a one-stop <coughs> shop um, provider model uh, there, which is challenging, but it's highly effective. And they are very busy right now um, in August. Um, I'll continue to give you online or uh, enrollment updates. One uh, comment here before we move to our learning work. So there's 16 implementation items there. That is a big number. Like I said earlier, it's ambitious. It'll test our capacity. But we as a team felt like these are all things we uh, are definitely committed to and felt needed to stay on uh, the high priority 
initiative list. And if you notice that the, in the spring and again this past week, once a month I'll send the board a department update in alignment with the five strategic directions. So you'll get um, once a month a deeper look into what's going on in each department around those five areas. You, every other week you get kind of the higher level things that are happening week by week. So we're, we're in that rhythm now of giving you a once a month update and I know Kate and Robin and um, others help put that together. Each department you know, gives a bit of a summary. It's another way for you to have a bit of a progress monitoring on these initiatives as we move through each month um, until we talk more about this bigger calendar coming. So I'm going to shift us to... No, we have letter E. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I, get, I got cut off. Here we go. Wow, thanks. Good catch. <laughs> Last one, address, acknowledge, and reduce systemic disparities, barriers, and inequities as we lead, develop, and align our district towards continuous improvement. Um, so the two big ones here, um, well, Brian, let's talk about vision cards. We, we just recently shared with the board where we're at with that and a couple updates here. Sure. So our progress uh, monitoring tool uh, to see the, the impact of our, our high-priority initiatives, uh, we have... Uh, Situated uh, in the calendar that Corey will be sharing later, we'll have five updates, uh, one for each of the strategic directions. And so we'll have a vision card to be showcased in October, December, February, April, and June. And the, the implementation work for, for the vision cards, this will be to populate the vision cards with the existing data that we already use and collect in the system. And so that's year one. And then uh, we'll be working on the indicators that we don't have uh, uh, as, as standard for developing and pulling that data and sharing that as, a, as, as standard work in the system. We'll be building that out this year and implementing that next year. So a Companion to the monitoring reports, when you get those, we'll have the vision cards connected to each strategic direction. Uh, recruitment and retention strategies, no easy task right now. So as you know, for the last nine years, this has been a priority work for human resources across the system. And, as I'm sure you're well aware, we have a workforce shortage across the nation. Mm -hmm. So while it's been a priority for us, we know we need to change our practices. So we move this into implementation because we are relearning and we are adapting our practices to be both virtual as well as in-person strategies for both recruitment and retention. We've done a number of virtual job fairs to try to recruit across the state and across other states. Um, we have done a number of community events that are in person, working with the FACE team, community education, transportation and food and nutrition services and custodial services. We've partnered together to be out and about in our community to try to attract and retain diverse candidates. We've hired, with your strategic investment, our three new ESP professional development liaisons, and they began July 1. So we are thrilled that they are going to be out in sites. They're working in collaboration right now with our site managers, and they will be at sites beginning in September to work with our ESPs to train, to mentor, and then the goal is to retain those ESPs. And then finally, um, we are working to enhance our applicant experience as well as our onboarding experience so that those who are brand new to our district have a really good experience when they're both applying and when they've been hired for a new job and we get them into our system in an effort to continue to retain our applicants. All right, I'm going to move us into the learning work side. So these are the things that we're studying, we're researching, we're developing possible initiatives. Um, with it, and that might might move or likely move to implementation, depending on the outcome of how we study these things and get a little deeper into understanding. I have so, a quick question yeah. before we do that, and we can hold if you want to wait till a certain point in time for questions. But relative to the implementation work, um, given the staff shortages, are there any particular initiatives that we feel are at more risk? Um, for us to be able to implement given those shortages, or are they all kind of eat? There's nothing that's um, more or less at risk than another. I would, I would suggest that there aren't any more or less that are at risk. We're trying brand new things in addition to those that we've done before, like partnering with North Hennepin Community College for Orientation Week and trying to get um, hourly staff <clears throat> through our Grow Your Own program and being in front of other college students 
in an effort to recruit and retain. So, um, yeah. So maybe like an example. My question is with the multi-tiered systems of support. Are, yeah. are we disproportionately oh, short there? Here's that a good example. Risk? I'm thinking of Kate. So you know, we have 16 mm -hmm. special ed teacher openings still mm -hmm. right now. It's mid August. Mm -hmm. And a lot of ESPs. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have we're nearly 100 short across the district, not just special ed, but that's primarily with the so. That is forcing us to come up with contingencies yeah. on how we do service delivery, how we're going to meet the needs and legal requirements of our IEPs, and every district around us is in the same spot. So as we work through our special ed opportunity review, we look at best practice and research. We're always looking at that through the lens of doing the capacity, staff capacity, do those best practices. What does that require? When you think of caseloads and other things, I know our, our buildings are, I think, the world you shared today. Mm -hmm. Our buildings are getting very creative of how to utilize different people um, in, in reallocating different staff to meet some of the requirements we have. So that's kind of in jeopardy, right? It's a good example. Um, even, uh, you know, the referendum, if that doesn't go through, we're, we're going to cut more people uh, in addition to the shortages that we have. So that, that'll create even more challenges with delivering on those initiatives. I think that's a good question to keep asking as we move through the year. Yeah. And as we do monitoring reports. Right, right, exactly. Because I think yeah. with setting the vision cards and establishing those reports, we may have our targets, yeah. but we may want to be realistic about the degree of risk of hitting those targets yeah. and reprioritizing and moving quickly to say, you know, Are we're just not going to be able to make the progress we expected here. Should we yeah. divert our energy and effort yeah. somewhere else? I mean, I'll add in, I think, Laura, you mentioned earlier today, we're in a fairly good place with our certified teaching staff not including special ed and not including SPs. When we know we have bus driver issues, we know we have nutrition services, custodians, those, those kinds of areas are challenging too. But it's not, not unique from the last few years, actually. Mm -hmm. So we're not in as dire of a situation as um, some of our neighboring districts mm -hmm. that have 300 teacher openings. Mm -hmm. We have 52. Yeah, that's good context, so, too. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, good questions, and we'll get to a little bit more once we get through this last column here. It's a little bit shorter, shorter list, not as not as many items. Um, so, building a better future phase two. John, I'll give you an overview of where that's how that's coming forward to, to the Sure. So, phase two is a comprehensive look at facility and building needs throughout the district. So, we have had six different groups studying specific areas um, in conjunction with. Um, the ECMAC group that is providing recommendations based on um, either, either over capacity or under capacity situations in our buildings. Um, a final report um, from those study groups will be presented to the board in October. And then, the, uh, as Corey mentioned before, the oversight task force will convene, and their job is to prioritize all the recommendations from those groups um, and, and figure out the funding sources, which ultimately would lead to. Um, a recommendation to the superintendent on a potential bond question that could be held sometime in, in 2023. Um, with that, we would also want to um, survey our community to find out what sort of tolerance is there and is there support for that. Um, but that's kind of the process of where, where the study of Build a Better Future is, um, and that would ultimately lead to potentially a um, uh, an authorization by the school board to... to either have us move forward or not. Phase two is really contingent on us getting through phase one because uh, we need the people to be able to do any of the things that might come forward in phase two. And, and phase two really is a wide range of things. So that's anything from when we need, when we need an elementary school for the growth on the west side to uh, all the way on you know, con talk conversations we had around maybe immersion programming, um, and there things in between like 21st century learning spaces like we're in right now. So it, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of facility. Where do we put programs and what kind of facility needs do our programs need if they're doing it in best practice or style? So and, and it kind of fits with it. I mean, this is a long-term process. So even if yeah. we get through the study portion, mm -hmm. the implementation process is going to be in the four to five year range just to roll that actually. And you get occasionally asked about boundary changes. Those don't happen until all those decisions have been made, mm -hmm. right? Um, likely, likely, because we would like to do that in conjunction with facility needs changing. And there's some additions that we got to look at as well. We've got some Perfect. buildings that have um, over capacity issues, and we're looking at the under capacity and other sites too. And all those things will be coming forward in that phase two uh, set of recommendations. And then when they come to me, we, we work through those, and then eventually I decide what do I want to bring to you as a board for consideration, kind of like we did with this edition. 
how you made decisions about going forward with this one for here at Rice, Rice Lake. Um, second one on, and I failed to mention we're on uh, strategic direction A. So we're back to strategic direction A. So Brian will update you on um, LGBTQIA plus history and culture uh, as far as learning work. Right, so uh, the prior resolution is new, so we haven't had a lot of time to, to, to really be with um, and study thoughtfully the implications and begin our research. So this is very much the definition of learning work uh, in, this, in this category. And so this will look like um, initially um, identifying some partners. There is a Minnesota-based organization out front that's doing a lot of work to build support and capacity for school districts and organizations um, supporting scholars and families throughout the state of Minnesota that we'll be working with. And then um, it has implications for uh, our, our equity foundations training, how we refine that for, for next year, as well as our program improvement process for curriculum materials um, and, and adoption, adoption of those materials. So we're really early um, in the stage and, and there's not a lot to to offer concretely at this point, given you know the short time that we've had with it, so but uh, but a lot of energy within our Department of Educational Equity to begin digging in and, and advancing the work. So, board members, as we bring you um, monitoring reports and updates on this initiative, uh, that's when you'll get along with the others. So we think of we're grouping the initiatives, kind of tying them back to the strategic directions and clustering them together. Um, as we bring updates forward to you. Now, something that is a little more tangible is in the next area of uh, um, strategic direction B, some big program improvement studies happening this year that will be coming through Kayak. Jackie, be ready. Um, Robin, there's a lot to cover here. So. Right, and we've spoken about some of them during Kayak, but um, there's more to come. So this year we're going to be in our third year of learning work around um, English language arts. And so both our elementary and secondary have been engaged in this work for the last three years. We've spent, um, we've spent a couple of years really learning about the standards, learning about our current reality, looking at best practices um, around literacy instruction at each of the different levels. And so this year, we're going to, 74 elementary teachers will be piloting two different resources. Um, throughout the year, and um, if you remember our pilot process, and I think I've explained it before, we have monthly meetings. We look at um, academic data along with perception data of the teachers and of the students, um, and tra really figuring out how to get um, really some good data from families, too, about how they're feeling about the materials that their students are engaged with. So that's an elementary. In middle school, actually today and the day before, we've had middle school teachers here really figuring out what they want to do, and they chose to also choose a curriculum resource rather than write their own materials. So they're reviewing different resources that are available for middle school instruction right now. So that's what they're going to be doing this year, um, and they're trying out some lessons and having um, some opportunities for the students to engage with the materials and the um, other teachers and hopefully um, parents and community members before making a decision. And then in high school, um, which is actually happening yesterday and today too, we had high school teachers in really laying out what high school literacy should look like and really digging deep into the standards. So they're at that very initial place of like, which standard lives in what area, what year, and really making sure that, that they have a plan for that. They've already identified um, several different resources that they want to continue to look at, and a lot of them um, have to do with Brian, what Brian was talking about. We're really looking at... Um, text by indigenous authors. And so we have a large selection of texts that will either make it in make it into the actual instruction piece or they will be student choice pieces that um, students can choose to use for a specific assignment or they'll be in classroom libraries. Um, and so that was in collaboration with um, Ethan Neerdahl and the Department of um, Educational Equity. Um, we are in the very, very beginning stages of looking at um, secondary social studies and really what we're going to be doing this year is focusing on what's our current reality, what do the new standards look like, and how far off are we, what kind of materials do we need to um, look at, and what kind of training do teachers need to teach the new standards. Um, our copyright on our social secondary social studies is 2010, so a lot of things have changed, um, and we want to make sure that we are giving our 
our students the most updated information and multiple perspectives and really having them be thinkers about social studies. Health is another piece that we're going to be in the very beginning stages of this year. Um, there, we're both, we'll look at both elementary and secondary and really dig deep. The elementary copyright date is 2003 and the um, secondary one is around 2010 too. So we'll be looking at um, what do we need, what's missing um, compared to the standards, what's actually happening right now in, in our instruction and making sure that as we move forward we have a vision for what health instruction should look like in Osseo area schools. And lastly, um, in secondary, um, we have um, high school teachers developing an earth systems course that's going to be taught at ninth grade. And this um, really is, we've waited for this course because this is the newest piece of information that came from the standards. There are more standards around earth systems than there have been in the past. So making sure that it has a really good transitions to the other areas of science. So they were in today too, looking at um, how they want science to look for ninth grade students. So throughout the year, we're going to be continuing to provide professional development because all of these changes are not, as um, as we talked about before, Superintendent McIntyre said, they're not about just the materials. They're really about the instructional shifts that need to happen in order for students to engage deeply. So is this, are, uh, will that be inclusive of all, like I think about like AP, HP classes as well? Mm -hmm. And it probably will be a staggered kind of okay. piece as we're looking at HP, AP classes. Um, oftentimes we start with the core required classes and then build out based on that. So it's going to be, uh, for social studies and health, it'll be um, a multiple years in learning. Okay. Yeah. And like in the implementation column, we have year one. So yeah. as these move over, we'll have a year one, two, and beyond. Yeah. So board members, this, the takeaway is big, lots of curriculum changes in there. Any one of these in alone, when Robin took the job, I thought, does she really want this? <laughs> 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 it's, it's, Too late now. <laughs> it's, it's the big ones. It's reading, yeah, yeah. it's science, it's math, it's health, it's physics, chemistry. All the core area subjects are going through some form of, of uh, update. Um, now, that, the good news is I, I believe this will positively impact our system and our results. So it'll take some time to get there because you've heard of all the complexities around it. But in a normal year, you might tackle one of these. And so, Tanya, your question's a good one. You know, as we work through capacity, we're, we're ambitious with this. Um, and yet I think I'm confident, well, we're feeling confident about being able to move through and we're feeling good about the implementation items. And then we're sure learning a lot this year about how many 70 plus teachers? 74 elementary teachers volunteered to be part of yeah. the pilot. So and despite we, everything on their plates, they right. volunteered. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited about that. And the writing teams that have been coming in for secondary this week have been huge and they've been excited and really Good. just motivated around the work. And maybe if you read between the lines, we're getting back to instruction, mm -hmm. right? Yes. We've been really stuck in operational things that we've been forced to deal with. But I think there's a desire and an urgency to get back to really high quality core instruction that you talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to letter C, uh, strategic direction C. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about the, the study work we're doing around site communication tools and best practices. So there are so many ways for our sites to communicate with staff and families. So we're really going to take the year to take a look at what all those different methods are and work collaboratively to determine, you know, what are the, uh, what should you use when and how um, is the best way to communicate. So making sure that we're all on the same page with what are the best practices that should be utilized. Um, and then we're just going to have translation really be a big part of that as well. And then this at some point, probably you'll see in the next year or two, will lead to school-wide communication plans similar to how we have district-wide communication plans. So making sure we have that kind of written down on paper as well on, as what their plan is to reach out to all their different audiences. So really we're just in the learning stage of finding out what is going on um, at each of the different sites and being that helpful to, to assist with what their needs are. Uh, we just brought on a new mass notification system called Blackboard and things are going really smoothly with that. So that is um, one tool that they can utilize but trying to simplify that a little bit more and in explaining what different features and kind of the benefits to using that at what point too. So um, that's kind of the first stage in that. And board members, you've experienced it, the variability we can have across our sites. So really trying to get more consistency and um, efficiency around how we communicate from the site level because our families are most connected to their schools, right? 
that comes first before any district level communications. The legislative action committee item is one that I've emailed the board kind of periodically on, and we're going to be able to implement that at some point this fall. So putting together, we there's a number of districts around the metro that already have these in place, and we're studying them, and really trying to steal the best pieces of it, right? And we'll, um, we're also developing an application process similar to what we do with our other committees for community members to be a part of that. So that is coming, and um, my goal is to make sure that's in place and operating before we get to the point of the board and establish our uh, legislative platform. It's so another have a, day. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's coming as well. Uh, all right, letter D. Uh, Kelly and Steve are going to talk a little bit about the process. Can you take this yeah. one? Okay. Yeah. Steve can so, take this um, one. So as Corey mentioned, um, the, the, the plans, the three, three-year operational plans, uh, really uh, demonstrate the, the move from uh, from large to department to now the schools, and so that's that's actually starting up right now. Um, it's not a new practice. The school improvement pl uh, uh, process is not new, but obviously having the schools uh, develop a three-year operational plan is new, and so that's going to be some some different challenges for our schools. So the documents that were shared uh, tonight um, really represent each of the levels elementary, middle, and high school, and, and it's been a product of a collaboration between um, uh, LNA and our Teamworks team, as well as Kelly and I. Um, so, and also one of the things to note, um, as this is happening, uh, what's going on is data digs in our schools. Robin's team has been leading that, uh, where they're looking at their, uh, both the summative and the formative data, so that's going to be informing the plans and so like our previous school improvement plans in terms of the format the, the requirements are going to be around uh, completing reading math um, student management and family engagement goals um, one of the differences for our secondary schools is they also do a graduation goal um, and so as far as that you know this is uh, where the schools are going to identify where those initiatives or actions fall so whether it's in learning work uh, implementation or certainly in standard and so uh, they're also going to be identifying within the plans the five strategic directions so as you can see it's going to be aligned to what what's happening at the district level department level but it's also going to have our teams really push on really identifying those strategic directives um, so we anticipate this is going to be a challenge for our schools this is different um, this is what we want we want our schools to be thinking about um, learning work. That's not something that necessarily has been in their, uh, in their wheelhouse. Um, so it's going to explicitly bring out um, different levels of thinking. So even though it's a challenge, uh, when we uh, introduce the format <coughs> in the spring, you know, some of the feedback we're getting from the leaders is this is positive. So it's going to allow them and their school teams to really think differently about their work. And similar to previous our previous process with SIPs, all that will be shared uh, publicly so it'll be on the websites and everything. So. All right, new teacher mentorship supports, Robin. Yes, and so kind of along the same lines as what Laura was talking about, really working on making sure that our teachers feel, our new teachers feel confident and competent as they're entering the classroom and working with students. So this year we're going to be learning about best practices and preparing teachers and, and helping them dig into resources and really do professional development with new teachers. Um, we want to know what what they need and we'll be surveying them and talking to them and reaching out. We also have several staff members embedded in buildings, so we have staff development and assessment specialists and we also have instructional coaches that we'll all have along with our new teacher mentor um, and the new teacher mentors from um, student services and our, our teachers of color will have like a group of students that they they are group of teachers that they read that they connect with often and so that they become that familiar who do you go to kind of person. Um, we began this work actually this week. We've been meeting with um, new teachers at all of our Title I sites, and we've had them together, and so we've had 46 new teachers at Zanewood for the last two days, really digging into curriculum, um, talking about what the first days of school should look like, the first weeks of school, meeting each other, kind of building those relationships across the different sites and getting to know who are those people that they can call up and say, hey, you know, can you help with this, or what should this look like? Um, so we're going to be 
surveying them and really just having those conversations with them through the year to talk about what do you need, what would be helpful, what is the just-in-time um, place that we can provide this training for you. We're also rethinking how we're doing new teacher workshop with presenting kind of just what they need at the time. So we started, we shortened the before school day um, to really be specific on what do they need to know as they're entering the classroom on the first days and then we're going to provide training throughout the year on some pieces that can happen like right before they're doing grades for or right before conferences what should conferences look like right before they start doing their observations with principals what does that look like what kind of support do they need so those are our goals for that and it's going to be a learning time for us also and as you kind of hear Laurel talk about it's a competitive market mm -hmm. to get new teachers so when we get them we want to support them and keep them here yeah. and retain them and, and set ourselves above the rest so they don't start shopping for other places to go right because yeah. um, it's a buyer's market if you're a teacher you can go work wherever you want right now um, lastly our uh, strategic direction E uh, Kelly's going to talk to us about our instructional leadership academy Absolutely. So the Instructional Leadership Academy, which is also referred to as ILA, is a program that's offered for uh, through the Center for Educational Leadership, which is a program at the University of Wisconsin. Washington. And it's, or Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Not it must have been Tim in the background. <laughs> <laughs> the University of Washington. And it's also in partnership with the University of Minnesota. And we're actually, this coming school year, we're entering our third year of our partnership uh, with this organization. We began our work, if you can believe it, right on right at the beginning of COVID, so the school year 2020-21. And at that time, we had four lead principals trained along uh, with the four superintendents. We're all trained at that time. And then, not you specifically, Brian, but in that position. Yeah. And then last school year, we trained nine lead principals. And then this coming school year, we're going to train all the remaining lead principals. So everybody will be trained in our system at that time. Fifteen, and, the remaining 15 will go this year. Yeah. Elementary. And then every lead principal will be trained, including all of our new hires. So uh, during the academy, the principals get to observe and analyze teaching and learning in ways that elevate scholar experiences, particularly for those of our scholars that are furthest from justice, which is something that obviously was a real pull to us for this program. And they also develop practices in collecting qualitative data, giving, giving targeted feedback, and then uh, planning strategic teacher learning that can have an immediate impact. Uh, Steve and I, uh, last year and this past year, two years ago and this past year, we got to spend quite a bit of time when our principals were also going through the academy, stopping in and joining them for some of the sessions. And one of their focus really is having that common language around walkthroughs and what are we really looking for in equity-driven instruction. So the goal, the end goal of our partnership um, and involvement with ILA is to improve instructional leadership and teaching practice in schools and classrooms across our entire system. We believe that with a shared vision, our leaders can ensure that all scholars have a chance to grow emotionally, socially, and definitely academically. So we are very excited about this partnership. So board members, think of it this way. We have a lot of new curriculum coming. Then we're doubling down on what can our site leaders do to impact achievement. And the research will say teacher's number one. The next strongest factor in achievement is the principal. That's right. And if they're spending their time in management things mm -hmm. and not instruction, we're missing the mark. So this has been about recentering yep. and actually looking at what's on their plate. You saw the state survey. You know, the yep. things that are on the principal's plates are far away from instruction. So we're trying to flip that dynamic and have the instruction at the center. And then what are the best practices around this? And the next item on here is the Principal Support Academy. That's the training for Kelly, Steve, Brian, and I. And how do we, and, and Robin, and Kate, and Dwayne. Yep. How do we support them? Because if we're not doing our job right, and they're not getting supported, it won't work. So there's the central office component that we're working on. How do we best support and create space for them to be that kind of instructional leader at the site level? And I've appreciated the cross-departmental collaboration that's happening. Um, so I, I hope you see we're really trying to target double down on instruction. And when we talk about our results, these are the kinds of actions we need to take to, to drive 
better results who think of better instructional practice with our teachers, better leadership from our principals in our district office, and then better materials, content, um, all those things that are aligned with the standards. So it needs to be kind of a through line on all of it. And um, sorry for a little, uh, it's like a little uh, formatting glitch there at the end, but um, this is our year's third year, and we'll have all of our principals through that uh, training by the end of this year. And then it, you'll probably see it as an implementation item now, full implementation of the things we learned through the, um, the learning work that we got gone through. Um, so it's, it's led by University of Washington, but University of Minnesota and their program is kind of in partnership with our Principal Academy, is that what it's called? Principal yeah. Academy? Yep. I can't remember the exact name. Principal Support Academy? Principal Support Academy. RPSA one? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, oh, I, did I miss one? Is that the one that got cut off? Yeah. Equity right, so system equity tools and training. Well, my copy didn't get that. Two point oh. Sorry, Brian. All right. It takes a takes a team here. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's good. Oh, sorry. Well, I was going to ask a quick question. So, um, I'm assuming if, as we have the new principals come on in the future, they would go through this training, and then um, is this something that is differential that we're offering as a district, so that it's a competitive benefit um, versus other districts, or is this kind of the price of admission right now? Right now, we're in there with five other districts because it's a cost benefit to share costs across oh. multiple districts. Okay. So, I, help me with the groups. Why Zeta, Mounds View? 916, Duluth. Duluth. Yeah, Duluth. In the intermediate district? That's uh, 916. Yeah. Right? And, uh, Why so is that a... So yes and no. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. This is actually being offered to uh, the National Duluth. Superintendents Association um, to all districts. Now we got in on the early ground level because now we're, I think some of the groups had to fly to Charlotte this summer to get some of the training that they've been bringing to us here in Minnesota mm -hmm. because we've been able to cost share. So. It's We're not a standalone district. We couldn't afford it, honestly, on our own. Okay. But, it's a, but it's a good indication, too, because, for instance, us expanding now for the rest of our principals, and I believe Wyzetta did the same. Yeah. So it's 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 obviously taking root. As we have turnover, uh, if we have turnover, then we'll look up for ways to make sure that that training happens in future years. I know that I'm looking at Diane as a new principal. She'll be part of it this year. Mm -hmm. Some of those new people. And we eventually have to, uh, part of our work is developing a plan for the assistant principals as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they also will need to be trained. Mm -hmm. And then we can get those things as part of just what we do, standard work. Yes. So then as people come in, we've built that capacity internally and not relying on, on those outside third-party um, trainers so much as, as we are right now. So hope we kind of see the, the multiple facets of trying to improve the results and instruction in our, in our system. So I'm going to pause there. And open it up for questions for oh, Brian. Oh, wait, Brian. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not against you. I'm looking at the meter. I'm like, I thought we were doing pretty good. Okay. <laughs> um, so the as, as we mentioned earlier, right, um, new leader, new leadership, new reorg for the department. And so how do, how do we understand what the system needs developmentally to be supported and where we're at today? with uh, advancing equity in our system. So we will be conducting this year a program review of our system tools and the connected professional development. So our clear model will be under construction. Um, this year we'll be looking at um, EFT 1.5 and elevating that to 2.0. We've had some policy work and some resolution items that influence the design of EFT and we wanna make sure that, that this course is um, supportive of what our existing faculty and staff throughout the system, right? Uh, our work isn't done um, after we've participated in uh, a workshop or um, if you're not a part of the equity team or if you're not um, like inter integrally involved with um, how equity work is being advanced in, in places throughout our system. So We'll be working on a 2.0 for our Equity Foundation's training, and then we will also be looking at how we um, include Policy 508 in our prior resolution and in that work as well. So that, that there's a lot of a lot of research and study this year to to refine and enhance our, our systems tools to be inclusive of all of the commitments that we have. And Brian, is it fair to say also informed by our ECAP process that we did not that long ago? Yeah. Yes. Fair enough. I actually, actually, 
Yes, I have that. I might have missed that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and include the three findings from ECAP, climate and culture, continuous improvement, leadership and governance. I was trying to... <laughs> I beat it to it, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you'll see how this ties together on the calendar in a minute when we, I'll show you how we're running that through our cabinet, our system leaders, our learning leaders, the board meetings, our site plans, department plans. I have a concept map for you to see when we talk about the board calendar. But before we go there, so you'll kind of see the, the timing of all this. Um, but before we go there, maybe there's some questions board members have about any particular implementation or learning work initiative for this year. I want to make sure that I'm fully understanding um, one item. So um, our curriculum items are in under B in those boxes, but the LGBTQ history and culture is in a different box. Will So we have a rigorous curriculum approach and process, will the elements that are related to curriculum and teaching practices in that resolution go through that same review and process and approach? I, I think you could in, pick a couple different items that could live in multiple places. Okay. So, so it's just, it's in that box for kind of... Yeah. Okay. It, it, we kind of land on us the best place for it, but there's a number of them. And we actually have MTSS in more than one spot. Mm -hmm. We were trying to keep it in one place and it was hard to do. Even the, I think, of Kate's special ed, uh, work that we're doing. That could be a safe and welcoming environment issue. You know, it can connect to multiple um, disparate, reduced systemic disparities, especially like going to that one. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a number of places they could, they could land. And we were trying to have a bit of a balanced initiative list so they didn't all fall under one strategic direction and way too heavily on that particular area. So I don't know if I'm, Brian, you can add oh, to that, that if you'd like. That you answered know. it. Was, I just wanted to be sure yeah. I understood that. Yeah. And then did I hear we said we're going to partner with Outfront Minnesota in that work? It's a potential okay. partner that has done some work. Okay. Um, so okay. I, 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 I qualify that to say that, that there are different perspectives and opinions about, about many different organizations. Mm -hmm. So just studying to see what parts are they have have the systems felt that they have real value and where they may have fallen short on other pieces but understanding what's the sweet spot of their their um, expertise okay mm -hmm. that, that's Good that's the qualifier clarity. that I was trying to okay thanks that yeah. clarity Jack I'm sitting in my back too I'm sorry it's okay I just think it's, it's. I mean, to see this kind of laid out and then, of course, with the, I mean, it's just the collaboration um, is so incredible and I, you know, and I, it's so responsive to what we've been hearing and it feels good to kind of um, really see all this come together and, um, I mean, I think about the Principal Support Academy, I mean, that is, I mean, I remember in AMSB, we spent a long time talking about it, the Legislative Action Committee, the the curriculum, I mean, that, I mean, it's really big lifts in our district, but it's going to, it's the, these are the, you know, the ingredients that are going to propel us to that next phase district wide. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm just really excited about it. And I just, um, you guys have put so much work in and I, um, I'm, super, I'm very supportive of, of it. And, and what you'll see is mechanisms in place to monitor our progress. So we, with that kind of feedback, we can adjust. There, there may be some new things that come at us we're not even aware of coming, right? Um, or we, we go faster or slower than we thought on any given one and we can. So we, we had to have that progress monitoring approach to it. So maybe I'll pause again, like Tanya or Thomas or Jack, any, any items you wanted on some additional clarification on? No, uh, for starters, I love the format of this document. Um, a lot of these items, you know, we've talked about over the last year, about a year and a half. Um, I think the one question I do have is also related to curriculum. Um, I know that that is something that comes up pretty consistently in the community uh, as it relates to curriculum and um, you always hear about standards. Um, and just wondering how we can better communicate to families that um, we are doing a lot of work around curriculum and there's even more to come. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of a big question for me. And our, when we come to you with monitoring reports, the plan is to come to a work session and the board meeting because you get a different public facing, it'll be a shorter summary, executive summary of sorts. Here's where we kind of study things, but 
um, through those monitoring reports, that's one way we can communicate to our community about the work happening in all those particular areas that we identified, and, and there's a lot more work that's happening too. We didn't even scratch um, multilingual learners. It's another area that we, we are doing a lot in in the department plans you'll see. And um, I think the other thing that you made me think about is just like when we have parents asking mm -hmm. the review process or the input when we do uh, look at new standards and new, new materials. Especially for health. Yeah, yep, health, mm -hmm. social studies has been a hot one. It'll, you know, that's been a, a lot of conversation on social studies. Reading can always generates a lot of conversation too. So um, I think we've heard that and we're going to be really intentional about being clear about when those opportunities for input come around through our program improvement process. I think, um, I think what Thomas is getting at, not, not only the input, but the informational piece, the education piece for um, families, just um, understanding. understanding what, you know, the new curriculum is or, you know, some of those things like schools have curriculum nights, you know. Mm -hmm. It might be because we're implementing so many new ones that we might want to um, have a specific curriculum guide to showcase the new curriculum or a community information like we're doing for the crisis management. I'm just throwing that out there as a... We, um, so uh, Vanessa Gill and I have met a couple of times to really talk about what that looks like in elementary specifically mm -hmm. um, and she has met with Jill Kind about some secondary curriculum pieces also and got some input actually from texts from some from the rice committee and, and some other community groups um, but I think that that's the op that's a challenge and an opportunity for us to in we are at the place where we can invite people in <laughs> so I mean that's one of the things we had talked about after the elementary pilot gets going, having the having a community kind of open house or a couple nights where the pilot teachers can be there and really kind of talk about the instruction that's happening too. So I will say from personal experience our teachers do such a good job. Um, I know in my own kids they've been talking to parents and making things home to families around, you know, if they're piloting something I'm, mm -hmm. um, and I know like a lot of the PTOs do that too, mm -hmm. just like this is what's happening. So I've had a really positive experience. The example that comes to my mind is secondary math. It was a really big change, mm -hmm. and so we got a lot of feedback mm -hmm. in families because they don't—they want to know how the support. Mm -hmm. It's such a different way, yeah. right? And that that shined a light for us on okay, what information do we need to help mm -hmm. provide to caregivers, help support. This is different than what many of us even have when it comes to math. On that note, um, so I really love the information that we get when we're going through the pilot phase. I don't see as much of that information in the implementation phase. And I know now with the monitoring reports, I feel like we'll get more of that, even reviewing the summary reports, because I have heard um, quite a bit of feedback yet this year on the secondary math. And it'd be nice to have the data to understand, do we know, is it performing as expected relative to the pilot? Because I don't, and maybe it's just in the detail that, that the um, curriculum committee reviews but doesn't get make it into the executive report um, but so I think the monitoring reports um, are, are really going to be exciting to see and continue to hold ourselves accountable to the and as we get tighter alignment to vision cards so mm -hmm. those measurable targets mm -hmm. right that we, we're, that's what we're all hungry for is kind of those metrics and how, how do we know what's our dashboard how, we, how are we performing right, right. and even if it's the um, more uh, qualitative um, but it's still kind of having a clear benchmark of expectations and um, clarity as to if we're meeting them or not. But it's really great to see this um, come to fruition on one page as we've been talking about this for multiple years. And so it's, it's really um, rewarding, and I really appreciate all the effort as well that has gone into getting us here through all of the challenges persisting through that to get to this point. Some of our cabinet members would tell you there's been many years we've maybe had seven, eight initiatives, maybe nine. I think my first year you were working on reporting back on nine. We have 16 and then seven new ones. So uh, it's a lot. Uh, but it's all work we kind of agreed we are committed to. So the trick is getting that commitment through the system, right? So drilling it through departments to the site plans. Um, and these are the tools that will help us have much tighter consent. Reducing some of that variability that we've all seen across 30 sites. I'm going to hand out uh, this document. I'm going to just send it in both directions. There's three pages to it as it comes around. 
Thank you, Sherry, for a creative way of holding them. <laughs> and don't let it be the busyness of it throw you off. It actually does make sense. So we're going to start kind of wide, and then I'll drill it down to the one year board calendar that'll be the next document. And feel free to yeah, help yourself. So what this does, especially speaking to board and average because our cabinets kind of had some time with it. I wanted to, this is the superintendent's annual planning calendar. So link it to your one year board calendar. That's kind of the board meeting topics, right? Mm -hmm. But you can see how that, how we get to that point. There's a lot of work that gets us to that point. And our goal is to be, we've been in such a reaction mode for the last three years. This starts to map out over, this is like a year at a glance. And you can see by months, and even the weeks, which week, and actually behind this in my own, I have the actual dates. You can see, um, so for example, I'll start with the school board. When, uh, you're able to see that small print starts a little bit small, but monitoring reports, implementation updates or data vision cards, professional development or special meetings, listening sessions or organizational meetings for the board, your, your unique meetings versus regular meetings and work sessions. And this plot spills out by week, month over month for the year. And I'll just highlight, for example, our strategic directions have letters A through E. So because of, and I want to thank Brian and our cabinet team for thinking this through, we had to look at when does data come to us? When do we have it? So we're actually going to go in reverse order by the way we report back to you as the board. We'll actually start with letter E and work our way back to A based on when the data is ready for us, how we can populate our vision card. So by the time we come to you, we actually have the, the evidence and data to back up those things. And we map them out every other month throughout the year because that's when the data comes to us. So we can come forward with those monitoring reports and trying to time those out with your other meetings you have. So the, the work sessions, the regular meetings, the special meetings that are uh, populated throughout the calendar. And this allows you to kind of crosswalk how we prepare for that. So, um, for example, on our, uh, the, the step above on the cabinet meetings, we are building into our cabinet meetings quarterly operational plan uh, strategic planning meetings. So before we come to you with um, before we come to you with updates, we have to process through that as a cabinet, and before we can do that, the cabinet members have to process that with their departments and how are things going at the sites. So it's staggered in a way where we can, we can. so the week prior to the cabinet getting together and doing that, they're meeting with their departments and getting their um, progress reports and, and kind of the accountability steps around that. Also it maps out, um, we will be doing once a month strategy meetings on various topics at the cabinet. So for about three years we've been logistics and operations. And we're flipping, we're actually moving our cabinet days from Mondays to Wednesdays in the afternoon so that we have uh, tighter alignment for the planning for the board meetings and pre preparation for all of you. So that's a change. And then you can see also we just uh, put in here when the learning leaders meetings happen from, so when I have the opportunity to be in front of our roughly, what, 60? Is that learning leaders group about 60? A um, little more, so yeah. Systems is 160. Yeah. So we're 70 some. 70, okay. Yeah. So when we leverage the, the power of that group in relation to when we bring things forward through our cabinet to the board. So you can see when the plotted out when our um, learning leaders, my learning leaders are superintendents, uh, the superintendent, because Kelly and Steve and Brian have DLTL learning leaders meetings monthly, basically Correct. every month. Every month, yeah. Um, the system leaders is the June and, and um, July, so we just, or August. We just have the August kickoff, and then we have the the June wrap up, that's for the 160 members of our leadership team. And then we in, included here the school improvement plan, uh, key pieces of uh, the, the high level important steps in that process throughout the year um, for the school improvement plans. And we added a community piece here as well because we're talking about um, planning with case help and others, a state of the district. Message. So timing that out to kind of capture all this and where, what's our, I think kind of tell you just did one recently, right? So, or uh, for example, referendum is, is, is plotted there as well. Now the other thing I missed too is like board members, your professional development sessions are also kind of mapped out here. We uh, 
took your survey results and Christine and I and Brian with some cabinet input are mapping out what you want to see occur during the course of the year as we pull cabinet into your PD sessions right, that we talked about. The back two pages are just breaking the year into half. So you can see a little more detail like the first page is the first two quarters and the second page is quarter three and four. So the first page is the full at a glance and then it just makes it a little larger. This is our first draft. Literally just came off the press today. So it's still a work in progress, but the concept is how we're taking these district initiatives, drilling them through department to the sites and how we're leveraging our leadership teams to be centered on all the same strategic investment, continuous improvement items, right? As we um, circle back to you as board members throughout the year on implementation updates. And so we will, um, the initiatives will be bundled, right, by those strategic directions that you've set. And then as we do this, we'll learn from it, we'll get your feedback, and we'll make changes, right? But we haven't had a plan full, since I've been here, a, a intentional plan for the year around when things will come to you and how are they aligned to the strategic plan. We've been reacting month by month, um, probably out of necessity because everybody has it, so the best we could do. But as, as you see these initiatives, these are planful, intentional ones, and we have a timeline set around them. Um, that's the intent of this. And then to drill it down a step further, this is the, the first draft of the one-year board calendar. If you remember last year, as we started the year, it was a little thin because we, we started with the things we know have to happen, like the budget has to come at certain times of the year for your approval and the updates that come around the budget. That's a good tangible example. Or um, your levy votes, those have to happen at certain times. So what we've done here, and I'll just give one example of how we map this out on the board calendar. Um, if you look at and again, this the intent is this will come every work session, and we're going to do a better job of actually dedicating time to reviewing it because we're not more not successful at that work. I'll just do a little highlighting of a couple things each month. Just as we start the year, there's some things we know need to come throughout the year. So I'm on page two, it's, it's the July to December part of the year. So for example, in August we'll have our um, resolutions calling the special election. You'll look at the updates from John that got from MDE to help us with the final numbers on the referendum. In September, we'll have our brush fire survey results. So we'll do that, remember that second survey to learn what's changed since when Morris Leatherman did that in January. You know, the economy's changed. Has What's the tolerance level of our communities? Has that changed as we are in the final stretch for the, the referendum vote? Um, I just highlight another one. We'll have our new student board rep, so we'll have introductions at the end of September as well. The preliminary levy, things like this that are um, seasonal and timing is, is they're kind of a set thing on the calendar. Then when we get to October, you'll have your first monitoring report. So we would start with the initiatives tied to direction, strategic direction E, for study at work session, and then a shorter executive summary at the board meeting so that we're communicating up and out to our public the down and in at the work session so we understand it internally and then we go up and out to the public and letter uh, direction E comes first in October. Uh, strategic direction D comes in December. It's about every other month so you can see the pattern. So then strategic direction C, if you flip to the next page, is in February. April is strategic direction D in April and then June is strategic direction A and that is again hinging on when we get our data. So certain, certain data is collected at certain times of the year that drives you know, when will we have information for you on our progress and success around each of the uh, strategic directions. There's some other things that are in here. So um, a lot of these won't look uh, too unfamiliar, but we've already mapped out the building a better future phase two. And if, you know, depending the results of our phase one, we'll make adjustments to it if we have to make adjustments. But right now we're at least planning out where we'd ideally like things to land. And then as we move through the year, you know, different things will be added. If you remember last year, we made tweaks to this uh, regularly um, 
that's why we review it at every work session. Some things get moved to different months or taken off or added, and our cabinet reviews this. We try to do it every week, especially leading up to board meetings or work sessions, so that we're um, as up to date as we can. Another example, I'm thinking of Laurel, we talked this morning. We have placeholders for uh, negotiation strategies and or contract ratifications. It may not always happen every month we pull those off if they're not ready, but we have placeholders there for when they are ready as we enter in the new round of negotiations. And we'll already have some information this month coming forward. Correct. Right. Progress on that. Um, then, like even the public engagement pieces we've mapped, we include the community informational meetings on safety and risk management. And as we move through the year, if we do additional ones, we'll begin to plug those into this, this board calendar. So there's some staples that are just part of, you know, when they come in the, like the financial audit, we know that comes when it comes. And um, the bulk of these initiatives that we went through tonight will show up in those five You'll know what time of year they come, because uh, that's when we have the most information ready to go. We wouldn't be ready for that uh, strategic direction A in September or October. We don't have that data yet. We're just launching it here. We'll have more information by the end of the year. So hopefully you see a connection with the directions for this year, the department plans that were in your packet, the templates for uh, the site plans, some intentionality between planning the year. Um, leading to the board meetings. So the work that comes through the administrative board from the sites to the departments to the cabinet, our system and learning leaders, and then the planning that comes in preparation for the board meetings, especially those monitoring reports. And we're actually, I know board members, you were desiring some different formatting to how we do the presentations at the meetings, a little more concise model, and we're exploring different alternatives to so it's not so much um, reading the slides, it's more of we've given you the information, we're going to get the highlights of some of those things and maybe a little more of the data that's going to come as part of the monitoring reports. So the cabinet has a little more work to do on that, um, but that's something we know that you desire as well. I'm going to pause there. Questions, comments, thoughts? This is kind of where we're at today. And then we'll, each month, you know, I'm going to hand that placeholder to review this. But occasionally I might update this for you as well. So that you, you have a sense for when things are coming through the system to you. Okay. So I'll try to call someone else to help me uh, gauge um, feedback. Should or we take a five-minute break? Or I think I'll be fine. Let's take a five-minute break. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost done. So um, I think it's just the last. We just want to ask you if there's any questions. If anybody has any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Robin. So one of my questions was um, I can appreciate the monitoring report timeline with certain data sets coming in, um, but can we do pulse checks or is there something to know? Are we on track or off track? Because especially when we think about um, direction A, it, this kind of feels like, yeah, we'll have new monitoring reports, but are we really going to know something different if it sort of we finally talk about it at, at the end of the year, and it's like, oh, didn't go so well. How can we kind of have the pulse checks or the key indicators earlier? So one of the things we talked about was in those monthly department reports, because yeah. they're tied back to the strategic directions. So th that's one way we can give you kind of updates on the work going forward. Um, also, um, honestly, through our, I meet with each board member one-on-one, -on -one, we can give you some updates in that regard. Um, I don't know if your desire is to, to have them on multiple board meetings or not. Yeah, no, I'm just wondering how do we see ahead of time? Um, are we directionally on track or off track so we can yeah. take course corrections before we get to yeah. um, a, that point in time, especially the ones that are later in the year that are really important? Um, yeah. like that, that's the intention. The, the mechanism for that for me, because this is our internal plan, is the quarterly we are looking at all of these quarterly and then once a month at the strategic meeting, um, like all the strategic uh, planning meeting. At, so we're setting aside a cabinet meeting every month to spot check how we're doing and then quarterly going deep on all of them. Mm -hmm. So that's probably an opportunity for me to connect back with board members like, hey, we're on or we're off track? Yeah. You know, what are the, what are the um, yeah. external influences? Was that what it said on our on the visual? You know, there's there's factors and you know influences that might that impact our, our progress. Yeah. Good or bad. 
Yeah, and that's really what I'm getting at is yeah. are we on track or yeah. off track? So yeah. we, that's kind of drilling down through the department plans. The, that's the intent of this is to have some alignment that kind of feeds up through the system. Um, I'll have to think more about how we could feed more of that to you, especially for these later ones in the year. Yeah, right? and it doesn't have to be super data intensive, so we, we can talk yeah. more. But my first reaction was those monthly department updates that are tied mm -hmm. back to the strategic directions, because mm -hmm. our team looks at that through the, the initiatives, high priority initiatives, and then the department initiatives as well. Yeah, my other um, kind of key priority item is thinking about the school culture, environment, safety, um, and having kind of early indicators. Um, are we in, a, in an improved situation at the start of this school year in the first couple months relative to where we were last year so that we um, have an understanding earlier? Anyone can jump in. Um, it's hard to forecast what we're going to see starting by here. Your right. question is yeah. when will we have a, a report yeah. on how, the, how it's going? Yeah, like incidents reported through the first couple months relative yeah. to last year. Are we better or worse? Things like that that we that we have the data for. We yeah. can see if we're on track. You know, the you heard our principals at our June meeting, I think, talk mm -hmm. about you know, this is a, a really a reset for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And getting centered on a lot of these is going to position us, to, we believe, to be a lot more um, ahead of the curve on that. I think, in core, so I feel like my department that? report yeah. that would pick up risk and, and that emergency preparedness should be able to touch base on something like yeah. that on a monthly basis. So, we kind of have an idea. And we typically, at our learner leader monthly meetings, we typically have uh, the position for district level principal Amy. They report out on that at least by mid-year. So we end the year. We'll start the year next week when we meet. She'll go over where they ended with some of their uh, student management data. Then we review it again mid-year, and then they'll end the year reviewing it. So we look at it three times a year in those meetings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those will be built in opportunities to share that with you. Yeah, and so Amy can share any of that data. You kind of say what you said earlier. There's the quantitative, and then there's the like, we hear yes. the perception, yes. <laughs> and it doesn't always match the data, but it's so perception's reality sometimes. So, um, the, the first part of your question around are we positioned better to? So we talked about the reset. Mm -hmm. So knowing that last year was a really difficult year in terms of behavior, um, how will we know that we are in a different position this year than last year, and how soon will we know that? Like when will we? Like, yes, we're like it's better, or oh, By no, we're not year. seeing. Yeah, I would even you know even like um, by mid try, like we like our enrollment. We have, but we think by end of October, our enrollment levels in, for example. By the fifteenth, November, 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 November one is the date we use. Yeah, yeah, and we feel like it's settled in the schools by October fifteenth. Mm -hmm. I think I think that there there's a there's a there's a recognition by leaders as we've heard them talk with us um, at, at various times not only at the Zoom session and in conversation that Corey's been having with folks as well as just our conversations as we've been working with them over the summer um, there's there's an intentionality yeah. um, around how we get to start yeah. this year and building community and cultivating the community and really doubling down on how we teach our rituals and routines how we teach our PBIS positive behaviors um, that that was like restricted and limited and, and, and like we were mitigating, 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 mitigating uh, the, the the COVID measures all the time. So they're they're excited yeah. um, to be in that space, and so I imagine that our early day will probably be really good. I was reflecting today on our mm -hmm. August board meeting last year and how challenging that was. That was, that was a hard start to the year. We had a you know, big interruption in January. Um, just a lot of influences that we, um, there was a question about enrollment and our enrollment fluctuations last year well that was being driven by where you fell on the COVID um, mitigation spectrum um, some families wanted to be with us because of masks and some wanted to not be with us because of masks right those are all things that were really wild card variables that just really were swinging so wildly this year some of those things aren't part of our narrative part of our reality it's much in the same way and back to some of the uh, instruction that we were limping through 
mm -hmm. uh, probably for about three years. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see what we addressed earlier around uh, how well our buildings are staffed, yeah. how strong our so yeah, no, The other part that's harder to predict, like, you know, we've had a lot of challenges in the community, too, uh, in different communities with this um, violence and behavior in the community. And so we've been really trying to work even closer with our city leadership. Um, we're going to continue our monthly meetings with, uh, it actually includes our community college partners. There's a new interim president that had been attacked. And um, along with Rolando joining us and then continue those conversations so that because we had some really big behavior things last year, like serious incidents that we, you know, every school district was experiencing. And right. I feel like we'll be better. Right. I think we have to just give it a chance. You know? Yes. I mean, like, yeah. I yes. can report back. I have one in every um, yep. Uh, yep. Uh, elementary, starting middle, and high school, and I think you just have to, like, there's been a lot of communication already to families, or I've received a lot. I have, um, you know, they, they tell you, like, what to kind of have your kids, you know, what the expectation should be. Um, so I, you know, I, well, I'm looking at this and looking at our strategic directions and, um, you know, I think as a board, we've really laid that foundation for the strategic directions and these are, you know, excellent initiative, tangible initiatives. Um, but I also think we have to have a, a little grace with just um, getting it going because with the hard reset, I mean, that, that is a huge piece of it. Um, and our stakeholder surveys yeah. tell us a lot too. So our family, staff, and scholar surveys, you know, will we see a difference this coming year versus this past or past three years? Basically, that's true. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the point that we have the intentionality, we have the time, we have the ability to do it this year is, a, is an actual difference versus last year that can be articulated. So that's the type that's of information that's really helpful to be able to say, yes, it is going to be different this year because we did this rather than we've got a bunch of plans and we'll watch and, make, and we trust that it's okay. So I think that data point is really helpful um, to be able to articulate. There were points in there where we were just making sure we had enough people to keep the doors open. Yeah. I, I, don't, I mean, I just want to be careful. We were not, I mean, it wasn't all negative. That's not true, okay? So that's, I think we have to be really careful of, of that. Like, we had a lot it, of creative things come out. Yeah, of I mean, the there's a lot of improvements and I things agree. like that, but it was... We're on. We're in a good foundation. Does anybody else have any questions? No, Jackie. No, I just. Um, I don't have a lot of questions because these are very thorough, and I just super appreciate that they were um, very thorough and easy to um, digest. I feel like um, for a long time we were like trying to like walk through. We're in Minnesota, right? We've got a bunch of lakes. Like, you're walking through the muck to get into the water, and it's just a little harder to walk through the muck so you can get there and swim, and I feel like we're swimming now. Like, we can now just take off. Like, it was hard to see how all of this was going to come together, and this page just beautifully puts all of the pieces um, together um, with the remembering that all of this came out of community engagement, and it's hard to... Remember that because it took so long to get here. But this was through all those um, community engagement um, groupings that we did to get to um, this place. So I'm very excited to get the the data and the qualitative data and um, see how this um, you know starts playing out and how we shift and pivot. As you each read the department plans, too, uh, I encourage you to reach out to the cabinet member that oversees that. Yeah. Um, because there is a lot there, and a lot to ask you to digest in the week, yes. let alone tonight. So I would encourage you to read them and follow up with any questions. Uh, you'll have a lot more questions this as you unpack all yeah. this. But if you walk away from with anything, there's this, hopefully our intent is the alignment. Yep. District, yep. department, to site, and then the mechanisms to hold accountability towards them, all that, right? That's I, our next stage. I want suggestion on this, um, and I'm guilty of this as an educator. There's still a lot of acronyms that if you're not an educator, you might not understand. So just, you know, just a reminder of when, like I saw WIDA in here several times, and I think if mm. you're not 
you know, if, if you don't know that background, mm -hmm. you know, just I know. know. What yeah, I know we, we yeah. process through that as a cabinet ELF. team as well. Yeah, we yeah. did is, um, I don't know what it stands for, but it's um, the whole oh, main, oh, sorry, I don't know what it is. Testing okay. for EL. It's the main organization that oversees the EL yep. the standards. Yep. And so they um, they're the ones that have the access testing and all that. Which the access testing is to see which level your um, uh, an English learner is at. So are they proficient? Are they? Yeah, I was going to add with the acronyms. We we talked a lot about that as cabinet as well. But you know, as we think about this with department plans, these are really the internal operational plans. They're not designed for public consumption. Right. Where we would have changed language should it be publicly posted. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, but well, that's a good point. And, and uh, even some of our staff would struggle actually. Um, Marquita, you know. Ah, I was just thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> hey. uh, yeah. Right? She mentioned that today, yeah. all we the acronyms. So yeah. even, our, even our own staff can get yeah. stumped with some of the things that yeah. we're acronym sure. heavy. All right. Okay, thank you very much for kind of trying to digest this, and this is just the beginning. This is great. All right. This work session is adjourned at 8.16 p.m. early.